Well, here we are again. Honestly, in the five and so years I've been on this channel doing YouTube, I honestly never thought I'd have to cover Charlton's ownership as much as I have had to do. Honestly, I mean, it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And I was sitting here after Thomas Sangar took over the club saying that hopefully this is the last time I'd ever have to talk about an ownership for a number of years. And probably, what, nearly three years later? Here we are again, talking about Charlton's fourth potential ownership in three years. As as you could tell by the title and the breaking news that broke yesterday, I do apologise if this video didn't come out yesterday when the news actually broke, but we're doing it today. As you will all know, Charlton are in the midst of another takeover. SE7 Partners have agreed a deal to take over the club subject to EFL approval. A SPA has been signed between SE7 Partners and Thomas Sangard, and they are now awaiting EFL approval. They have to pass the owners and directors test, obviously, which will obviously take some time. The rumoured time length is between six to eight weeks. That's roughly the guide, That's or roughly the length that's been given to us, which will take us probably in the worst case scenario up until the start of the season. So... It's very imminent. It, it looks very, very close. It looks like the deal is, well, the deal is agreed, obviously. They just need to pass the owners and directors test. And this is going to be quite a serious video. Obviously, in the past, I have, you know, laughed and joked about the ownership situation. But I want to kind of take it seriously today and discuss my honest feelings. Because I think I've said my honest feelings on social media already. I'm not that excited or at all excited. And I have concerns going into this because... I mean, ultimately, I don't think any Charlton fan can really right now, going into this new ownership, have any trust of anyone that comes in at the moment because we've just been misled for far too long. And we've had owners in the past that have come in, have constantly over-promised and under-delivered and have taken the literal piss out of the club and have led us to dire straits. So... I don't think there's much trust coming into this ownership right now, especially considering the characters involved when you delve a little bit deeper. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to discuss SE7 partners, those that are involved that we know of anyway, the rough background check and my honest feelings going into their takeover, which I'd imagine will be done. But obviously we need to see if they get the deal done first of all. The SBA has been signed, but they still need to go through the director's test and actually get it done. So I will begin by reading the club statement, which is very short and brief, to be honest with you. It just features a quote from Peter Story and stuff like that. So I'll just read it now. Charlton Athletic can confirm that a deal has been agreed for SE7 partners to purchase the football club. A share purchase agreement, which is the SPA, has been signed by the club's current owner, Thomas Sangard, and SE7 Partners. The club and SE7 Partners will work with the EFL to meet its requirements before approval for the takeover is granted. That, of course, being the owners and directors test. The club's CEO, Peter Story, said, and to be honest with you, the first quote is exactly what I've just read there, so I don't know why the club have included that, because it's actually a cop copy of what's been said there. Anyway, I'm, I'll skip past that quote. He then says, In the meantime, the day-to-day -day running of the football club will not be impacted. Our preparation and recruitment for the 2023-24 season is well underway. We have our targets for our men's team and our women's team, led by Dean Holden and Karen Hills. Those plans continue to progress and will not be halted whilst we await appro the approval. The aim is to put the club in the best position to achieve our targets for next season, which is a top six finish for the men's team and further progression for the women's team. The club and SE7 Partners Group will communicate with supporters as soon as the takeover is complete. So that is the club statement. They don't really give away anything in terms of the personnel involved. Obviously, we know roughly who the personnel are, but if you remember correctly, when ESI first took over the club, apologies to bring them up again, but they, this won't be the last time I bring them up. But if you remember when they, were took, when they took over the club or when the deal was agreed back in November 2019, uh, the club gave a bit of a rundown in terms of the people that were involved. I think that was obviously Tanun Nima, Matt Southall and Jonathan Heller was the other one that actually gave background checks. They haven't done that this time. And to be fair, I think it's not really surprising because there is a lot of ambiguity surrounding the people that are involved. If you haven't worked it out already, SE7 Partners is Charlie Miffin's group, the group that tried to take over the club back in December of last year and obviously they've been working on a deal since then uh ever since dean holden came out came into the club they've been working on a deal and obviously they brought in um other backroom staff the likes of andy scott uh jim rodwell and ed warwick to come into the club to facilitate the takeover and obviously the jammer transfer window passed 
those three that I've just mentioned that ended up leaving the club because Thomas Sangard decided to do a U-turn at the very last minute and decided to turn down uh, their proposal. Dean Holden, of course, remained in place because he signed a contract until the end of the season, whereas the other three only signed six-week contracts, as I said, to facilitate the takeover. I'd imagine that if the deal went through then, they would have been given longer-term contracts and they would have stuck put. I think the biggest concern for me with this group is the fact that it is Charlie Meffin's group. Charlie Meffin has put this group together and obviously his time at Sunderland and the Netflix documentary Sunderland Till I Die paints him in a picture and it tells you all you really need to know about his character really. He was part of the ownership that was by far the worst period in Sunderland's history and his comments about the fans and the controversy that surrounded him and the decisions that he made and his overall time as owner of Sunderland was very, very controversial and we'd have to say very underwhelming. And I do have a dislike towards Meffin already because of that and I have concerns going into it purely because of how he's run the club previously. But the one thing that I don't understand about this takeover is the media coverage. The narrative that the media are trying to spin in that Charlie Meffin is taking over the club, when in reality, he isn't. It's SE7 Partners that's taken over the club. According to Meffin, uh, I think it's according to Meffin anyway, or the rumour is that Meffin will have a minority stake in the club. So he won't have a overwhelming say in the day-to-day -day running of the football club. He'll just sort of just be there and sort of just... Well, basically, he's the one that's put this takeover together and he's the one that's put these characters into place, got them together, put the bid together and obviously has subsequently gone through. So Meffin is not going to have a uh, a significant role. That being said, the article by the South London Press today about our CEO, Peter Storey, who obviously came in fairly recently, obviously the ex-Portsmouth CEO, I've not really covered him on the channel um, in the past at all, but yeah, that's who our CEO is. Um, I was a bit concerned by the article this morning in the SLP saying that Story is expecting to leave the club when the takeover is done, which gives me a bit of concern about Meffin, you know, because he says, oh yeah, I'm not going to have a role, but I, I, I just guarantee, or I'm hoping this doesn't happen, but just watch, he just does a U-turn and goes, oh yeah, I'm the CEO now. Like, it's just, <laughs> it'd just be typical Meffin, really. Now, if you take a look on Company's House, or I don't know if it's still on Company's House now, or what it was in the past when the takeover was first done, there was only two directors listed on uh, Company's House as SE7 partners, and that, of course, was Meffin and Ed Warwick, who was one of the three that joined the club as backroom staff. I believe he was our finance director. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, Warwick, Warwick was, and I believe still is, uh, a director of SE7 Partners, and obviously, as I said, he joined the club uh, back in December when the um, when the bid was supposedly ongoing, and they were trying to get through with Sangard. They were in a period of exclusivity, and obviously, Jim Rodwell joined the club as well. Andy Scott came in, uh, Rodwell coming in as the COO, and Scott coming in as technical director to help with the recruitment. Um, uh, in the January transfer window, and obviously Dean Holden was brought in as first team manager at that time, which I think with this takeover, I may as well say it now, is in my opinion a massive positive. I think the fact that Holden was SE7 Partners' choice for manager, it shows that there's that trust there and there's that relationship there, so you naturally would think that they would give him the backing in the transfer window. So that, I think, is a huge positive. There's already the relationship there and they obviously get on with each other and there's that element of trust. But I think the other three... Uh, obviously Warwick, um, Rodwell and Scott, their time at the club, it, although it was for six weeks, it was very underwhelming and very concerning because, I mean, I have concerns, first of all, as to whether all three of them are going to come back to the club on roles uh, when the takeover is completed. I don't know much about Warwick and his time at the club, to be honest with you. I don't know anything about Warwick, to be honest with you. All I know is that he came in as the finance director in December for six weeks and then is the director of SE7 Partners. Jim Rodwell, like Charlie Meffin, comes with a reputation at Sunderland, a very bad one as well, one that's not really approved by Sunderland fans. And as for Andy Scott, while he has a fantastic CV, his time at Cholton in terms of helping out the recruitment was underwhelming because the January transfer window, let's face it, was a sham. That being said, I don't think he could really do much with the tools that was provided to him. I think the recruitment team, obviously, with Martin Sangard and Steve Gallen, has been underwhelming for two years and has failed us completely for that period of time. And obviously, with Thomas Sangard looking for a way out and not looking to invest in the club anymore, you can only do so much. And he was left with signing free agents and loans 
all five of which that we signed in January realistically not offering much at all to the club and not really impressing when they came to the club in the short period of time that they were here. There are concerns with the individuals involved with those guys because most of them come in with poor reputations. Warwick is sort of an unknown character. Scott, I think I feel a little bit sorry for, although to be fair, he did sort of big up the transfer window and I didn't really like that. You know, again, just again, just another classic example of broken promises, false promises and over-promising and under-delivering really. But I think the main thing that we need to discuss in terms of SC7 partners are the main characters that are involved. Obviously, the rumour is Charlie Meffin isn't going to be one of them and he's obviously the one that's put the deal together. The main person that we know of that is going to be part of the takeover is Joshua Friedman. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really know much about this guy. I've tried to do as much background research as I can, but what I've discovered is he is an American businessman. He was born in Boston, Massachusetts, based in Los Angeles. He's 66 to 67 years old. The internet doesn't know how old he is or his birthday, but that's his age. It's not really relevant, but I just thought we'd say it anyway. That's, that, that's the extent of the background research that I've done because there honestly is not much that I know about this guy. What he's known for is he is the co-founder and owner of Canyon Capital Advisors, Again, I don't really know what they do. I have tried to have a look in terms of what they do, and I'll be honest with you, it was quite hard to get my head around. But I think the most important thing that Charlton fans probably would like to hear about this guy is he is a businessman and a billionaire and has clearly a lot of individual financial wealth, which obviously is fantastic. And obviously Charlton fans are going to get all excited about it. And I've seen some people have got excited about the prospective takeover. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like I said, a lot of people are going to be excited about the fact that, oh, he's a billionaire and he's going to have loads of wealth and he's going to splash loads of cash into the club. Like, it's it's unrealistic. And ultimately, we don't really know what his intentions are because he's never actually come out publicly and said, you know, oh, I'm interested in Charlton, even though we know that he is going to be the main uh, figurehead of the takeover and one of the main people in charge he's never really come out publicly and said like oh or spoke about the club whatsoever he probably will obviously when the takeover does go through if it goes through because it still has to go through uh, the relevant tests but yeah Friedman is one of the main people involved and the other person that we know of that is involved is Gabriel Brenner who unlike Friedman does have experience in football as I mentioned it in the previous video uh, when I spoke about this takeover falling through back in February um, he has a minority share in MLS club Houston Dynamo. Now, obviously, I mean, I think I speak for everyone when I say the quality and the difference between the MLS and League One is substantial. It's quite vast. He only has a minority share in Houston Dynamo, so he doesn't have a say really in terms of the running of the football club. And if you actually take a look at Houston Dynamo's record over the last couple of seasons, for the past five or so years, they have consistently finished at the bottom of their conference. I think for actually a couple of seasons running, I think it was 2020 and 2021, they finished rock bottom of their conference. So not great. Besides that, there's not really much known about Brenner. All there is to know really is he has a minority stake in Houston Dynamo and that's it. So he has experience in football, but as I said, the MLS and the League One are two very different leagues and it's a very different kettle of fish. So that's really all there is to know at the moment about the takeover and the personnel involved. And there is a lot of ambiguity about it and there's way more questions than there are answers. That's to me anyway. I've got so many questions to ask about this ownership and I don't have all the answers to it. But I go back to what I said at the start of this video as to why I am not excited whatsoever about this takeover and why I have concerns. Obviously, this has been going on for some time. Many bids have been rejected in the past. Obviously, Mefin, I think the initial bid was, I think, ten and a half million pounds, and obviously Sangor changed his mind at the last minute and turned it down. Then Friedman put in a improved offer, I think, of eleven million pounds, and Sangard almost immediately turned that down. Um, initially, with the deal, Sangard obviously wanted to retain a stake in the club. Uh, I think it was, I think it was initially reported to be twenty percent, but it actually turned out to be ten percent. And now, with the bid being accepted, the bid is now rumored to be, I think, twelve and a half million pounds for the club. Sangard is relinquishing all of his state shares in the football club. So Sangard will leave the club when this takeover is done. And obviously, well, I think the reason why the improved bid was going on is because he wanted to get as much money out of the club as he physically could to cover the losses that he's had from the football club from when he's been owner of the club. So it's all very... I don't know, man, because... I don't know why Sangard initially wanted to keep a stake in the club anyway and then just looking for more money. I mean, the reason, I just said it, the reason why he's looking for more money is because he wants to compensate the losses that he has taken on uh, since he's uh, taken the club on. But anyway, going back to what I said about 
not being excited about it. I'll go back to what I said at the start. Us fans and this football club have been taken the piss out of for far too long. Over the last 10 years and maybe even beyond that, owners have come to this football club with their strategies and have made an absolute hash of it and have thrown this club down the drain. Roland de Chatelet with the network of clubs, he still owns the Valley, he still owns the training ground and he wants a ludicrous asking price for it and he's going to be the biggest pain in the arse and the biggest hurdle when it comes to this takeover because obviously the SE7 partners have got to agree a leasing deal and a rent deal for the Valley again. So, but anyway, the Chatelet, you know, like I said, the network of clubs, the constant change of management and then just completely giving up and just not wanting to invest in the club and looking for a way out. ESI, one of the worst ownerships in EFL history, how it was allowed to happen is a disgrace and they nearly threw the club down the drain, nearly put us in administration and as for Thomas Sangard, while I will give him credit for giving it a go when no one else would, he stepped up, saved the club from administration. While some Charlton fans don't want to hear that, that's the truth. He did save the club from administration. But unfortunately, besides giving us Charlton TV and making the women's team a professional team, that's where the good stops with him. And unfortunately, his legacy has been tarnished. His ego got in the way. He was far too stubborn. He surrounded himself with inexperienced people. He said, you know, football's too easy. Football's not that difficult. And he realised too late how difficult of a task it was. And we've now had two very underwhelming seasons with the previous season to this one being the worst season in the club's history. And now we're left right now with SE7 partners who, again, come with a lot of controversy. Charlie Meffin from his time at Sunderland. Jim Rodwell from his time at Sunderland. Ed Warwick being a nobody. Andy Scott with the comments he made about the January transfer window. Joshua Friedman being a bit of unknown when it comes to football, although he has a lot of wealth. You'd probably have to say he won't want to invest that straight away or invest millions upon millions of pounds. Gabriel Brenner, while he has experience in football, has experience with a very poor MLS side. So there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of questions and concerns than there are answers. But the one thing I'll say about this is first of all, they've got to get the deal done. They've got to get it done first of all. Let's see if they have actually got the bottle and they can strike a deal. And Well, they have struck a deal already. Let's see if they can pass the owners and directors test and then they can strike a deal with the Chatelet and then to get the takeover done. And then let's see what they do. Let's see what they do because actions speak louder than words. All of the owners, all of the predecessors before SE7 Partners, if they do take over the club, have failed in that. They have constantly promised and they have under-delivered massively and made a hash of it. Unfortunately, with this ownership, while they'll obviously be excited to take over the club and with an ownership comes a fresh start, a new beginning and an element of excitement, that's what it should bring. With Cholton, like I said, we have just been misled for far too long and we have trust issues and now it's got to the point where the owner has to do the talking and they have to prove themselves. Season ticket holders will still be holding on. I'm one of them, still holding on to see a little bit of ambition. I, I mean, I say that. Most likely, I'll be renewing very soon. Knowing me, I will be renewing because I just can't stay away because I do love this club a bit too much. But ultimately, this ownership, if they can get a deal done, they need to prove themselves to the fans. I'm not going to roll out the red carpet and welcome them with open arms. Certainly won't because they need to prove themselves. They need to back Dean Holden, which, like I said, is a massive positive. The fact that he was brought in by this group to facilitate the takeover back in February, that's a massive positive because there's a relationship there, there's a trust there. But there's also the question of the transfer window because the transfer window opens very soon. You know, Peter Story saying that the budget has been approved, the budget's been in place. Obviously, the South London Press confirmed today uh, that we have made a bid for Alfie May from Cheltenham Town, the Glo uh, Gloucestershire live journalist. John Palmer has been covering Alfie May for many months now uh, about his rumoured uh, move away from the club. Us, Derby, Millwall and Wrexham have been linked in the past. Uh, he came out recently saying that Cholton have made the first official bid with Derby still interested and the South London Press have confirmed that. So it's very interesting to see where that's going to lead because obviously... I'm imagining SE7 partners can't do anything in terms of backing Holden whatsoever because they're not the owners. And obviously with the budget being approved, we don't know what the budget is. We don't know how expensive it is, how much money is involved. I don't know where we've got the money from to bid for Alfie May, to be honest with you. It seems very strange that Sangard would still invest in the football club when he's looking for a way out. You know, whether SE7 partners have got something to do with it, I have no idea. And then there's obviously the question of, obviously, the recruitment team. The recruitment is still the same. Martin Sangard and Steve Gunnan will still be the recruitment team 
going into next season, which is the recruitment team that has failed us for the past two years. You then have to raise question marks as the players they sign before SE7 partners come into the club, whether they'll like the players that they sign. Like I said, there is so many questions and very little answers. But to end this video, like I said, I'm not excited about it and I'm concerned. I am. I have concerns about the individuals. I have concerns about their motives. But the one thing I'll say, they have to get a deal done first and then they have to prove themselves. They have to show us that they have the best interests, the club's best interests and the fans' best interests at heart because the previous owners that have stepped before them have not. They haven't done that and they have taken the piss out of this club and these fans and it has to stop. That is it for this video, guys. I hope you guys did enjoy it. If you did, can you possibly leave a like, subscribe if you are new to the channel, turn on those post notifications so you're notified of every time I upload a new video. Let me know in the comments below, guys, what do you think about SC7 Partners and this proposed takeover? Are you excited? Are you concerned like I am? Let me know in the comments below. This has been Tyler Roninson. Have a nice day, and I will see you all in the next video. Take it easy, stay safe, and I'll see you later.